We'd like to open the public hearing PZ2308ZC um, Spa and Cam Town of Stonington Sea Frost Master Plan Zone Change Site Plan and Coastal Area Management Review Applications for Creation of a Mystic River Boathouse Park Property located at 123 Greenmanville Ave Mystic <clears throat> excuse me, Assessor's Map 172, Block 1, Lot 1, Zone, MHD. Th thank you, Lynn. Um, seated this evening, we have Ryan Deasy, Chuck Sheehan, myself, Ben <coughs> Kovrick, Fred Dykeman, and Lynn Conway. Um, there are hopefully the correct sign-up sheets at the, um, when you came in. If you'd like to speak, we'll first hear from the applicant and then open the floor to public Comments, pros, cons, or general comments, and we'll, if Mr. Frost is okay, we'll pepper him with questions as he proceeds. And then the applicant could have a rebuttal after the public comment, and hopefully we can get to a decision this evening. Are you ready? All right. Thank you all so much. We'll try and be brief. Excuse me. You know, can you say your, your, your name and address, please? Yes. <laughs> can I give the town address? <laughs> um, no. So for those who don't know me, I'm Danielle Cheesebro. I'm the first selectman in Stonington. This is a town uh, project that we're obviously submitting. Um, thank you, every. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. Is that better? Yep. Um, so I want to invite Mike O'Neill up because he is someone who's been shepherding this project since the beginning in 2016. Unfortunately, our chair of the Mystic River Boathouse Park Committee got held up and couldn't be here. But we'd love to just give everybody here a little bit of background um, to kind of set the tone. And then obviously there's a lot of people here who um, probably want their thoughts to be heard. So um, we, if it's fine with you, I'd like to yield the floor to Mike to give a little more context. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and board. Um, thank you for having us tonight. There's a lot of people in this room that have waited a very long time for this evening. We've been, as Danielle said, working on this for 16 years. Um, I am the vice chair of the Stonington uh, Mystic River Boathouse Park Implementation Committee. I'm also the president of the newly formed <laughs> Better leave <than> everybody. <laughs> um, the president of the Stonington Community Rowing Inc., which is the organized body that will run the boathouse uh, once it, it is produced, once it is in existence. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the crew team. Um, we started 25 years ago with the dream of providing an opportunity for kids at the high school to get access to the Mystic River. Started with a small group of kids, 20, 30 kids. Um, in the last 25 years, we've grown to be one of the biggest sports at the high school, routinely uh, having 40, 50, 60, even as many as 90 kids involved in the program. We row in the spring and in the fall. Um, we, uh, many years ago, realized that there was a lot more opportunities for access to the river than just what we could provide for the high school, and we started working on a plan to provide a community rowing uh, opportunity for the town of Stonington. Um, I've been very fortunate, and we have been very fortunate, to be able to work with the former selectmen and current selectmen to help us formulate that process into a reality that you see in front of you tonight. It's been an effort of many, many people uh, who have worked tirelessly um, as volunteers to put this together. Um, it is something that I think will be a a game change in the town of Stonington. It's going to provide access to the river. It's going to provide community rowing access for all ages uh, year-round. It will allow us to move from just being able to support a small number of high school kids to allow anybody in the public to come down and get on the water and access the river. So it's a unique opportunity. It's a great utilization of the property. Um, and the park is even a, a, a greater asset to the town. So I'm here speaking just for, for my part about the boathouse. But Nick, you want to talk a little bit about the park? Certainly. Uh, Nick Keppel, um, I'm the chair of the, the Park Implementation Committee. And as Mike says, um, <clears throat> this has been um, a six year, I think, effort um, 
the good news is uh, I worked on a project in stores in Mansfield where it took them 10 years to create the, the, the little new downtown that you have across from the Yukon campus. So we're not there yet, but um, you know, 500 people showed up you know, six years ago to express their support for uh, another access point um, to, the, to our water resources. As you know, um, we're a coastal community with you know, incredibly limited access um, to, the, to, the, to, the, you know, to the water. Um, um, Jim Spellman wanted to buy what is now um, the winery. Um, uh, uh, on Route 1, uh, Saltwater, which I, I represented them, so I should remember the name, uh, but um, the town didn't want to go for it then. I, I tried to get the town to buy the pond behind you know, Seal Plumbing and uh, at the, where, where the original settlement of Sointe was, and for $100,000 uh, 30 years ago, the town didn't want to do that. Um, so this is a, an unbelievable opportunity to give the the townspeople and the community access to the water, um, which is a precious um, commodity. So I just want to say a few words uh, about, uh, because of so many people who have who expressed through their vote uh, support for this, so many people who've worked hard on this. I, I couldn't agree more with, with Mike. This is going to be, uh, truly believe, transformative for the community in so many ways. It's going to it's going to create this new gateway uh, to, to Mystic, which is going to uh, add to the already uh, remarkable appeal that Mystic has to the world. It's really going to change when you look at the pictures of what it looks like now with the, fe the fencing and the trees, and you're going to be able to, as you drive south on, on 27, you're going to be able to see the, the uh, tip of the seaport and the river, because one of the things we don't uh, you know, take into consideration is you can drive from literally Old Mystic uh, into you know the lower part of 27, and almost you know get these tiniest little glimpses of the river there. So it's going to provide a fantastic vista. It's going to um, and by the way, we know that um, the site has its challenges. You know we we grant you that, but any site at this point where you're trying to give the public access to the water is going to have its its various challenges. But it's going to be a phenomenal opportunity to transform um, the high school rowing program, but also it, it's gonna be allowed to build a, uh, a community rowing program. And uh, even though I am having had three children go through the rowing program, um, it's, and I'm so excited about, you know, in my lifetime, I truly believe we're gonna have a, an Olympian, not to mention, you know, we've already had countless successful college rowers, but, we have one, you know, one athlete who, who was probably a back injury away from participating in the Olympics, but we're going to have our Olympians. We're going to continue to send kids to colleges. Um, and, and on that, on the quick thing on the high school, the thing that blew me away about the, the high school rowing program was so many young people, boys and you know, men and young men and women, who hadn't done a sport until they did crew. And it had a trend, participating in crew had a transformative effect in, on, on their lives. A friend of my daughter's had never played any organized sports until she rode as a freshman uh, or so sophomore. She was in the original class, you know, 20 plus years ago. By the time she was a senior, she was so good that her rowing helped her get into Tufts and she, cox she uh, um, uh, stroked the Tufts nov in a f freshman novice boat, women's boat to third place in a national championship. You know, this is four years earlier, she had never done a sport before. So the, the potential that the sport has to change young people's lives is, is boundless. Um, and, um, but the other thing that um, shouldn't be lost is, this is not just gonna be the, home, the new home of the high school rowing program. It's gonna be a home for community rowing. And, you know, a friend of mine, um, Ed Monahan rows almost a million meters a year up uh, on Long Pond in Ledger. He's 83. You know, you're going to see that people who didn't think they were rowers are going to become rowers uh, because they now have this wonderful access to the boathouse. And, and lastly, uh, and, and not uh, insignificantly, um, we're going to make provision so that 
adaptive rolling can go on there. My son, um, who suffered a brain injury 20 years ago, uh, has rowed in a wonderful little adaptive rowing program uh, in Noank, but it's very limited. You know, it's only for a few weeks in the summer. But I have to share with you that just to give you a sense of what being on the water, how it trans people, transforms people's lives, there was a woman that rode in the adaptive rowing program uh, over at um, Engraten, um, who she lived in like Essex. Her husband would take her to Saybrook. She would take a train from Saybrook to Mystic, take a cab from Mystic to, to what's the name of the? Uh, BB Cove. BB Cove to the, there's a home. Uh, anyway, just to be on the water for, four, oh, she was, she was uh, visual, uh, vision impaired. It was so magical for her to be able to spend 45 minutes on the water that she took, went to those lengths to be able to get on the water. And we're talking about something that's going to allow literally thousands of people over the course of a year to have this kind of experience on the water. So um, I would, for all the myriad reasons why it's going to you know, transform and benefit our community, I would heartily uh, urge you to carefully consider and, and give full consideration to um, the approval of this plan. I can't Happy wait to see the questions. What's that? I can't wait to see the plan. Yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Good evening, Commission. Again, uh, my name is Chad Frost, Principal of Kent Frost Landscape Architecture. Happy to be in front of you tonight, uh, helping represent the town for uh, what is truly a transformational project. Hopefully we'll get the plans up there soon. There we go, thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll come back to the rendering a couple of times. I think this is the easiest plan to kind of visually be able to see, especially on the screen, but I'll go through all the, the CAD files that you have in front of you. We've also interspersed some photographs to help give you context as we go through. Assuming this works, there we go. Is there any way you can make that larger, Chad? Get rid of that. That's as big as I can go. Is that better? Any bit? <clears throat> sure. Better? Can you just just slideshow? Is that this is this is no. This is the PDF. This is the biggest. So we can zoom in. I'll get. I'll zoom in as we go through. Yep. I think everybody knows where this is. This is on Route 27, directly across from Rossi Mill. Uh, I'm here, fortunate enough to be able to talk about it, but I'm part of a much larger team uh, that was part of this design. So Phase Zero Architects is the architect for the boathouse itself. Weston and Sampson is our civil engineer on the project. AECOM is our LEP, that's the licensed environmental professional doing the remediation, as well as our living shoreline specialist. First Water Engineering is our uh, coastal permitting engineer. Down to Earth Consultants is our geotech, and Stadia Engineering is our local survey. Um, so I'm here, but there's a huge team uh, that's much smarter than me behind me. So uh, this is the survey. I'll, I'll zoom in uh, as we go around. The first thing I'll point out of the overall property, obviously Rossi Mills directly beside. Latitude, or the former Latitude restaurant, is right here on the right-hand side of the plan. Uh, something that's been a big topic of discussion uh, for over the years is the easements over this property in favor of, there's two of them. Uh, the first one I'll point out here is this, this sh first line from the property line over is a drainage easement. There's a large drain pipe right there that is the, all the drainage for Route 27 drains through the property. The second easement is in favor of the seaport. That's the entire shaded gray area that allows for the access in and out of what will be soon the Delamar Hotel site. Uh, I'll point out the rest of the site. This is the existing house uh, known as the Lovelace House. There's a wood deck that surrounds it, an above ground pool that has been demolished by the town, uh, a grass lawn, and then the garage. All along this frontage, as we're all probably very familiar with, there is a fence uh, that has been lowered a number of years ago, but it is a solid wood fence all the way along the perimeter. Uh, for the most part, the back of the property is just a lawn with a small gravel area. There are m minor amounts of trees. Uh, on the property. One of the very important parts of this project and this development is truly the history of this particular site. I wanted to show you this uh, to talk about the fact that the land literally would not be here. We would not have the land for this park if it was not for the Rossi Mill directly across the street. 
Uh, this is an image of the Rossi Mill and how it expanded over time. So in 1898, due to tariffs on silk, uh, we, we got a mill over here so that we could mill silk in our country as opposed to importing it. So in 1898, they built the first part of the, of the Rossi Mill. You can see across the street here how narrow the strip of land was. Right? So by 1904, this is how narrow the land is, that darker color. Uh, the river really came all the way up to the edge of Route 27. And by 1904 is when we have the first indication that the Lovelace House uh, was on site. The reason this land built and, and went out into the river over time is due to this tunnel that's directly under Route 27. This is an image of what that tunnel looked like. It's not huge, um, but it was an electric cart that they went back and forth. So in order to power the mill, the ships came up, they dumped coal on the beach, they ran it through the tunnel, burned it in the mill, and then came, brought it back through the tunnel and dumped it on the shoreline uh, when they were done with it. And all that coal slag is what has built this site. So you can see really over the course of about 30 years, uh, the site grew exponentially out into the river. Um, and because of that, we have land. And because of that, we as a town have the, a remediation project to be able to use that land. Um, but a pretty neat story uh, and, and one that we do want to bring to the forefront because I don't think most people understand it and we really do want to uh, tout the history of both the Lovelace House and uh, the Rossi Mill. Looking just to give you a little bit more history and context, uh, this is right as, the, you know, this is probably 1904 time frame. So the Rossi Mill, this is the first phase of the mill, was the northernmost piece and you can see the power plant. All along here, you can see that the road basically is a cliff and some rocks right down to the river. Interestingly enough, that white kind of four by four fence that's on River Road on the Groton side, right along there, is also what was along Route 27 uh, back in the you know, early 1900s. Um, I'll point out now as we pan over, this is the Lovelace House. Right now, you can see the water coming all the way up to it, and it looks like a three story building because the basement is a full walkout basically right to the river. And I'll point out this little shed where the roof of the shed is at the road, uh, road elevation of Route 27. That's what we believe is like the shed covering the tunnel access going back and forth. Uh, as we progress now a few years later, probably about 20 years later, you can now see the mill has about doubled in size, so there's significantly more mill. Um, and significantly more fill now piled out on the site. That same roof that we were just looking at is right there. So just the tip of the roof is now visible uh, from this side of the river. And again, you can see the house and pretty much the water still coming pretty close to it. And now uh, another 10 years or so, the, the shed that's, that was the access port is now gone. There's a new garage, which is the first half of the garage that's currently on site is kind of built. And you can just see how much fill all the way out. The Lovelace house, you can't see the basement anymore. It's filled all the way up to it. And the fill goes all the way out to the end and if you've been out there, there is a, a rock wall around the end and there's some old pilings that you can still see. This was the pier that was out there at the very end uh, where eventually instead of just dumping the coal on the beach, they started dumping it into an offloading uh, facility like that. So very uh, interesting history that we're looking forward to kind of bringing to the forefront uh, of the public as we go through this project. Back to the CAD plan, this is our, our simple demolition plan. Uh, the, the very simple part is that Lovelace House, uh, we are, we, we had a long negotiation with SHPO as probably you've read about in the newspapers. Um, we are keeping the Lovelace House and relocating it further to the north. Uh, the shed will be torn down and effectively because of the remediation, all of the rest of the site, we're stripping what little topsoil there is there, stripping some of the vegetation, and then we're required to fill for cap uh, of that, of contaminated soil. I will point out here that this is the approved parking lot for the Delamar Hotel access next door. That is within that easement area that I showed on the survey. Um, this is being built by the Delamar. So in this situation, we're acting like it's an existing condition, even though it has yet to be built yet. Um, and I'll just point out to you that the driveway entrance, we're just finishing up now our, our OSTA review for the DOT review of that driveway exit. So this is slightly different configuration than what you would have saw when we got our planning and zoning approval because OSTA has required a one way, excuse me, one way in, one way out, a right in, right out uh, for that particular driveway. Would you mind repeating that one more time? Sure. Or slowly. <laughs> so we're, we're just finishing up the OSTA review, the Office of State Traffic Authority. 
uh, review for that access, that curb cut onto Route 27. They, as you know, they won't review anything until local has already approved it. Um, and so what they are requiring, because there's a little bit of this turn queue lane, uh, that could, cars potentially could queue there, turning left into the seaport, that if somebody was coming north on Route 27, there could be cars there blocking the driveway in so they didn't want a left-hand turn into this driveway. So all I'll point out to you is it's a slightly different configuration than what you would have saw uh, associated with the Delamar. Uh, and they made us put in this rumble strip island to help direct traffic, although it is still flush to allow for uh, pedestrian access straight across it. So just wanted to point that out. Next is the, the improvement plan. Uh, again, I'm gonna jump to the rendered plan in just a second, but the details just to highlight for you, the zoning compliance chart. Uh, we are in the MHD zone that was changed a number of years ago from residential to MHD. And as you can see, all of our side yard, front yard requirements, we, we meet all of those requirements. From a parking perspective, uh, Stonington does not have Boathouse Park as a, a parking generator in the table. Um, and so what we did do is go to the, the uh, traffic engineering authorities and, and used Athletic Club because that's what closely matched how this building will be used. Um, an Athletic Club at this size of a building for proposed, we need 44 spaces. Um, what we are able to provide is 15 on-site spaces, four drop-off spaces, seven shared spaces, and then we have an agreement with the seaport to be able to provide 22 additional spaces across the street behind the Rossi Mill. And so that's what this plan shows. As again, this is Rossi Mill. Boathouse Park extends the entire frontage basically of the mill. Uh, the 22 spaces for the boathouse will be signed back here. As part of the Rossi Mill project that you approved a few months back uh, for the new entrance here, there's a new sidewalk going along the edge of the Pentway. And so we'll have at pedestrian access from parking back here all the way down to the lighted intersection for crossing coming to the park. Uh, and so that's how the parking will be handled. I will note um, that currently the crew team, if you're talking about Stony High School crew, uses the, the seaport for their practices. And they currently all you know, park, anybody that's coming by bus or by car currently parks at the seaport already. So that use uh, already exists today in that location. So we, th we think this will work out very well um, as we move forward. To quick run through the rest of the, the plan on a rendered plan, just to make it a little bit easier. <clears throat> Again, this is the, the current uh, alignment for that entrance exit for the, the half of the parking lot that serves the Delamar Hotel. What we're proposing is that on the other half, on the, the, what I'll call the park side, it is an entrance only. This is still a 24 foot wide aisle so that cars can fully back up and maneuver very easily, but it's one way coming in. We have a drop off zone all the way along here uh, that will serve both you know, parents dropping off or picking up rowers or the public going to put in their kayak. This is a rooftop launch area. So kayaks, paddle boards, canoes, those type of things on the rooftop. You can pull up here, unload your canoe and then go find a parking space uh, and come back again, so that's the drop-off zone. Then this side of the parking lot is two-way so that we can get vehicles moving both ways. Um, I'll point out we do have a large area for that drop-off. We have uh, removable bollards, lit bollards, uh, all along here to be able to keep vehicles from coming back into the park, but allow for a large area for people to be able to load and unload. We have our bike racks adjacent to the, the boathouse itself. This is uh, a public restroom that opens to the outside so that the, the park and the public have the ability to use a restroom that's not interior to the boathouse itself. Uh, we have the river walk as we loop all the way around. One of the things that when we were first starting this project uh, and talking about what coastal access would mean, right? We wanted this for coastal access. Um, as the more we got into it with the contaminated soils, we know we need to protect people from the soils. Uh, this portion of the beach, the southern area, has got a whole lot of glass in it. Um, and I've got a picture to show you that in a few minutes. Uh, but glass, yep. Um, so lots and lots of glass that we felt we could never thoroughly clean to be able to make safe for use all the time or to have the public be able to get down to it. Uh, this area of the, of the site is surrounded by that existing stone wall, which used to be where that pier was. 
uh, for unloading and loading coal. And then this portion of the site, the beach over here, looks to be pretty good when you're out there. Uh, it can be sandy at low tide. However, there are pipes and debris. There was another building that we know about here that was just pushed into the ground. Um, so the feeling was is that we could never thoroughly clean the waterfront itself, the edge of the water, to a point to where we know it would be safe to encourage public use. So what we are proposing is a river walk so that you can get up to the edge, up to the bluff, if you will, be able to see the water all the way around, and then have our, the two access points. So one for the crew team. This is the crew team's dock. It's a large uh, flat dock with a ramp down to then a very large float to be able to launch and land crew boats. And then on this side is the public float. So this is, a, the, again, a long ramp down to uh, a dinghy dock or a tie-up dock. This is for full public access. Uh, we've talked about it to be able to also help encourage the, the anchorage, the larger anchorage that's wanted out in the river, uh, so that people could tie up. If they come into Mystic via boat, they could take the dinghy over, tie up, and then be able to go into town that way as well. Uh, and then obviously the, the boat ramp. This is, as I mentioned, non-motorized boat ramp, so no backing trailers down, it's all car top. Um, I will note that we do have bollard lights all the way along the, the river walk. And I'll point out our, these little bands that don't look like much here on the plan. Those are our, our historical landmark indicators, right? So we have granite set in the ground, carved with a date and a time, um, to really talk about where the land was at a certain point. So that, that initial image of how the land grew over time, we want to bring that story to the forefront. We have some historical interpretive signages to talk about that. And then we're also putting that as a marker down on the ground plane. Uh, again, to, to bring that to people's attention. We have uh, some benches for people to be able to, to hang out and watch either races or just the river itself uh, all along here. And then we've got, this has been a very big community uh, project. We've had a lot of different organizations reach out and want to help and participate. Uh, some of the garden clubs reached out and said they really want to have a pollinator garden. So this particular area of the park is the pollinator garden with all native uh, perennials to be able to inhabit, uh, encourage that habitat. Uh, and then along the frontage is uh, in a large sidewalk, so this is now wider than what's currently there, to, again to provide a, a wonderful streetscape experience. We have the street trees, we have street lighting, it's the same lighting that we're proposing in front of the hotel, in front of the seaport, very similar to what's in front of Coogan Farm, so we start to create uh, a theme along there. And then one of the most exciting things uh, is the living shoreline all the way along the edge. So the remediation uh, requires at least a two foot of fill over the top of the contaminated soil. And so what we were tasked to do is how do we treat that edge? When you get to the water, you can't just obviously dump it off into the edge. You need to have some sort of containment. Um, and, and everything is the option. You can have bulkheads, you can have revetments, you can do all these things. But as we had early discussions with the town and with uh, the public, the living shoreline really rose to the top that people were really interested in. So this is a way to use nature to basically plant the seeds uh, so that nature can help defend itself against both just average everyday tides and storms as well as sea level rise. So this has been designed to accommodate 20 inches of sea level rise, which is what's predicted for our area up through 2050. Uh, and I'll talk more about that uh, in a little bit. Uh, quick, the sedimentation erosion control plan is kind of simple. Uh, we, are, we, we are affecting the entire site, so we have s &E basically all the way out to the very perimeter of the site. Uh, we do have some stockpile on site, although we don't really expect to have much soil being stockpiled. It's really just temporary subsoils will be stockpiled in that area as, as digging is necessary. We do have a dewatering area uh, if it's necessary during foundation uh, for the buildings, although again, Based on everything we've done with groundwater testing and, and monitoring, we know there's groundwater there. We don't think we're going to be deep enough to really get into it very much. Um, and so we have just a small area to accommodate that if we need it. Bless you. Um, grading plan. So uh, again, one of the things driving this project is we've got water, obviously, on one side. We've got the road on the other side. The road, the high point of the road, is up here at elevation 10. Um, and so it was important, obviously, to be able to get into the building and get out of the building and cover the, the soil appropriately with at least that two feet of clean fill and then get down to a point to where we can access uh, the water. 
I'll also point out that the Lovelace house, where it was currently situated, which is over here, as we pick it up and move it to this current location, it gets lifted up to elevation 13. So flood zone in this location is elevation 11. We're recommending 11 plus 2, which is one more, obviously, than your minimum required. Again, that's for that 20 inches of sea level rise that we anticipate over the next uh, 30 to 40 years. So the Lovelace house is located here, elevation 13. We have what we call the connector, which is connecting through also at elevation 13. And then when we get to the boathouse, because the boathouse is a water dependent use and it needs to be as close as we can get it to grade to the water because I rode in Yukon, I understand how heavy it is to carry the boats back and forth and you don't want to have giant drops and cliffs and, and grade changes. Um, so we were very cognizant of, of where we located that building uh, vertically. And what I can tell you is that we, we set this edge uh, the, the water side edge of the building at elevation eight and a half. That was intentional. Uh, the, when we, Hurricane Sandy, when it came up, uh, we took that mark as to how the high water got and we added 20, inch, 20 inches of sea level rise again to that. So that this building, that front edge, should be able to accommodate a category two-ish storm with 20 inches of sea level rise before we start to get water into the building. Uh, the building is you know, will be within that floodplain, right? Because it's a water dependent use. It does not have to be at elevation 13. It does have to allow for the flood to come in and go out um, as all uh, buildings do that are in that area. So this end of the building is at eight and a half. We do have a pitch within the slab. It is a, a fairly long slab. So it's actually a one foot of grade change as we go over the entire building. And we come out the front on the landward side at nine and a half. Um, and then we have quite a bit of grading to kind of make things work and be uh, comfortable both with the road and make sure all the, the drainage pitches away from all the doors. Um, what I'll also note here is stormwater infiltration. So as I mentioned, uh, Weston and Sampson is our civil engineer. They have designed a stormwater treatment system that does include uh, a, a separator out here in the parking lot. So all of the parking or most of the parking goes into this drain. It goes through a, a hydraulic separator before it then goes back into an infiltrator system. That infiltrator is mostly underneath the parking lot. And I'll note that we have this separation within the parking lot, a, a wide area of permeable pavers that also acts as a, a large surface drain. So we have a high point up here pitching this way towards the low point. And so as that water is shedding across this portion of the parking lot, we do expect infiltration through those permeable pavers, which then literally goes right down into the top of the chambers uh, and acts as our capacity storage. Um, so that does meet one inch uh, requirement for water quality volume from a storm generation perspective. Uh, there is no increase in discharge when you look through the whole 300 page uh, um, drainage report uh, that it says everything works like it should, which is great. Um, and then that, after going through the infiltrator, it does discharge out to the shoreline. And I will note that there is a weir structure in that discharge. We are intentionally trying to keep the one inch water volume and nothing greater than that. We had some discussions with the town engineer about how much was the appropriate amount. We didn't want to exceed the one inch because what we don't want to do is hold the volume of water right here and then for a longer duration and then start releasing it at the same time the wa flood waters or rain waters from uphill are getting to this point of the river at the same time. So we're intentionally holding the first inch, then releasing everything afterwards um, so that we don't compound a flood during a larger storm event. Uh, grading wise, we basically then, this whole river walk down here, our high point is about elevation six as you can see. We do have a little low swale between the walk and the, and the pitch down to the river so that any uh, water draining across this lawn has a place to settle out. Any sediment coming across can drop um, before it starts shedding down to the, the river itself. That's the grading. Some more, this is the technical components of the, the stormwater. Uh, again, I won't go into it all, but we do have all the roof leaders picked up. We do have electric service. We do have sewer service. Um, we have a note or a letter from the WPCA. We did go through the volume analysis on this building, and it was at that point there was a, a thousand gallons per day left in the cap. We were underneath of that, um, and so we met all those requirements as well. Lighting. Uh, as I mentioned, we do have street lights all the way along here. 
although these photometric rings look slightly different, uh, it's the same fixture all the way through. We're just using different optics within that fixture so we can throw light where we want light. So in, th in these locations, we want light on the sidewalk and out into the street to see people potentially crossing. In these locations, as the sidewalk widens, we want to spread a wider pool of light. Same fixture, same amount of, I'll say, lumens output, but just depends on how we throw the light differently. And then the bothered lights that you can see along the pathway uh, on the river, those are not meant to light up the park bright enough for people to really want to use it at night, right? And so this park, the park itself will be closed at dusk. It's a dawn to dusk park. The building itself will be able to be used after hours, just like all buildings can be. But uh, the, the police commission was concerned about easy access to be able to patrol. So that if somebody's driving, if, if a police officer is driving by, uh, they'd be able to see into the park and be able to tell if there was somebody there late at night that shouldn't be there. And so the bollard lights offer just enough light in there to kind of see if somebody's in there when they shouldn't be in there uh, and add a nice effect as well. John, could you make those motion sensitive? Could we make them motion sensitive? Um, no, my short would, answer is I don't know. I mean, that would really light up if somebody it, was supposed to. It would. To... Uh, we've done it for, for high-level street lights. Mm. Um, for like, we have, there's three settings on some that we can get where it's, like after two o'clock, they dim way down and then they can go on if there's an emergency. Uh, we could look into it to see if that's a possibility. Sure. And, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah. Uh, the lighting, is it the Ballard lighting? Do you see it from the water or just from the street? From the street. So these lights are 100% cut off fixtures. You shouldn't see the light source from anywhere. So the, the pole lights along the street. Uh, all the light goes down. The bollard lights, as mm -hmm. I'll show you right here, uh, has the light up above. So this is a, it's a stainless steel bollard. The light source is in the top and the light angles down out of it. Again, to get that dark sky compliant cutoff. You will see a little bit of that reflection on that stainless steel as the light comes out, but it's not the light source itself, so it's not a bright light in your eyes, if that answers your question. Okay, so you're gonna see it from the water. You will see a little. You'll see that little ring of stainless steel having a light on it. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Uh, this is the the pole fixture along the road. Again, same fixture that's in front of uh, the Thompson Building at Seaport right now, and will be in front of the Delamar. Uh, we did the. I say we. The committee. Uh, we we let the committee vote on all of these amenities, right? So it wasn't me picking or Danielle picking. Uh, but the committee, we put a big package together and let everybody kind of go through and rank and vote what they wanted. Uh, and stainless steel was one that was uh, we were recommending, but also the committee went with it because of that coastal environment and the ability for it to be able to withstand the longest longevity since it is a town project and we don't want to require maintenance uh, very as, as minimally as we can, I'll say. Uh, we have uh, permanent bollards, we have the lit bollards, and then we have removable bollards. We have the bike racks. This is the, the image of the bike rack. Again, a stainless steel rack with a bumper on the side of it, and then the benches as well. Signage and striping, I won't get into all the traffic signage. Um, it's all there, we can talk about it if you'd like to, but normally uh, what I would imagine you, you care most about is the actual signage on the, the park itself. We do have some institutional wall signs that go on the front and back of the boathouse. We have a freestanding sign in front of the building that identifies both the park and the boathouse as well. So we have, that's the freestanding sign. We have institutional signs on the front and back of the building and on the edge, the, the corner up here or the peak and then we have historical interpretive signage we we did label these as part of the signage uh, there will be environmental interpretive signage along the river walk that we didn't because it's not visible from the public view so if you remember like how we do everything for the MHD district for the uh, seaport if it's visible from the public view it gets counted as their signage if it's not visible then it's not counted as signage so that was the the determination there Uh, and these are the signs, so the, the two signs up on the building uh, and then the freestanding sign in front of the building identifying the park and the community rowing center. Uh, this sign panel at the bottom will be to signify upcoming events. So if there's, you know, crew weeks regatta, if there's a, a race coming up, it'll be kind of noticing the public of when that might be happening. So uh, if a particular weekend you might not want to drive down Route 27, um, you'll have a little bit of notice. Uh, planting plan, 
I won't get into it crazy unless you really want me to, but there is uh, linden trees are the street trees along the edge. This is the, the pollinator habitat garden that we put in that corner. Uh, a lot of great stuff happening in this living shoreline section with Cecilaria, or not Cecilaria, um, Spartina and sea lavender, uh, some penicetum, some native coastal grasses. Um, and basically what we did, and I'll, I'll explain here in a second, is we looked at what's working currently out there and, and then we tried to mimic that as best as we can because that's what, if it's currently living, it's our best chance for success. Uh, now the living shoreline. So um, this is AECOM's plan and then we, we will have some sections to show you as well. So what we looked at is what does work. Uh, and, and I'll zoom in here on the point. So this was the very tip of the peninsula. This stone wall symbol that exists, right? So that's an existing wall that's around the perimeter. The grading, as you can see, kind of runs through. So this is our uh, negative two contour. This is our negative one contour, our zero contour. So it runs basically through the wall. The walls are freestanding, if you will. The water fl just flows through the wall back and forth. So everything inside of the wall, we have some beautiful native marsh growing. This whole swath here is uh, Spartina. This is sea lavender. Right outside the wall where we don't have any protection uh, from that, at the exact same elevation, we have nothing growing. Um, and so what we came to look at pretty quickly, and this is an image of that exact area, is we have a beautiful native marsh growing in absolutely horrific soils, right? that wasn't planted by anybody, it's native seed that has come downstream, it's rooted and is growing really, really well in areas that has just enough protection both from the waves and the ice to be able to allow it to grow. At that, and this is all very elevation dependent, right? Spartina exists from like zero to one and sea of lavender is from one to two. At those same elevations out here where we don't have that protection, we get nothing. So the strategy for the living shoreline was to create what's called a rock sill, which is basically kind of a fancy name for a rock wall that goes along that same elevation where the current rock kind of works already. And that will s slow and break that wave energy as it comes in. And these are not massive waves. These are not, you know, surfing waves. This is just the wind fetch waves as it comes in, breaks that wave energy so that we have calm waters behind. It allows for the sediment that's in that water column to drop and be able to deposit, building a larger marsh behind it. To in encourage that marsh to grow quicker, we're actually seeding the backside of the sill uh, with some soil bags and then um, some spartina. And as I'll show you in a second, with mussels as well. The mussels out here and the, the symbiotic relationship between the mussels and the spartina is amazing. You need both basically to have either one su uh, succeed. So we're, we're planning to seed it with native mussels from the site. In this location, because we don't need to cover the ground, we're actually proposing to not plant anything in this range and let nature do its thing. We think that once we give it enough protection to break that wave energy, that naturally it will infill the rest of that marsh. Up here, there's already existing spartina and some existing marsh, and then we infill in between the bits uh, as we go up the hill. And, and then we regrade this slope. I should have mentioned that a little sooner. Right now, there's a very steep bank there. Again, it was just fill pushed out to the edge and left as a cliff and it's been eroding at the bottom so we're going to regrade that into a sustainable slope that you can see there with the walk at the top. Excuse me, Chad, what yep. is the elevation of the riprap or your... I'll show you in just, I have a section oh, okay. I can, I can show you. it really clearly for you. Yep. On this side, because again this is what we call a glass beach, um, we don't want to have the, the risk of having any of that at the surface. This is what we're doing in actual marsh creation. So we're actually placing soil there to be able to then put the plants in and grow the marsh from day one, as opposed to letting nature try to do it over the next couple of years. Uh, so in this location, we're doing marsh creation. And a couple of images of what it looks like kindly of right now. This is what that muscle spartina combination looks like, right? So everything is intertwined, huge populations of mussels and the spartina. When they mass together, they form almost like a reef, and you can see how that does protect the coast. What we need is a little bit more protection out here so this can continue to grow forward, and we get a very large marsh. What we do see, um, besides the sill, as sea level comes up, the longer marshes that we can get, as the, as the waves come through, that fetch, it just drags down the energy and it dissipates the energy, even just going through the marsh. So the goal is to 
expand that low marsh as much as possible. Uh, that's another example of, of the Spartina and the mussels growing together in between rocks. And what I loved about this picture is that the majority of the soil there is brick, right? It's, it's just the leftover that's been pushed into the water. Uh, in addition to mussels, we also have oysters. That's an oyster growing out there right now. None of this, all I should mention, all the shellfish is not for shell fishing. It's not for public consumption. It is too far upstream where there is no uh, testing for the water quality because it doesn't get enough flush. And obviously on this site where we do have contamination, we definitely would discourage it anyways. And then just so you can understand what I'm talking about when I say glass beach, this is glass beach. Uh, so those are not rocks. Those are all, you know, pieces of glass. So you can see the bottle, the bottle, the bottle. All these pieces, those are not, you know, that's... Those are bottled up. That's, it's bottles, it's panes <laughs> of glass. Uh, it's, it's just a lot of stuff that we don't want the public out there walking on. So that's why we're doing a marsh creation uh, on top of that. Excuse me, will you, will you have signage indicating that foraging the mussels is... Yes. Cool. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, this is the technical section... Uh, that, of the living shorelines and then the next this is we put some color on it just to help define it so this first top section which I'll zoom in this is that northern section uh, where we're, we're cutting back this slope already so as I zoom in this is the rock sill that's proposed you can see mean low water the sill is mostly out of the water mean high water just a little bit of its exposed and then mean high water with 20 inches of sea level rise the whole thing's exposed at the highest uh, normal high water mark. Um, then, as I mentioned, we're planting uh, the soil bag behind it with Spartina planted within it. The mussel socks get placed on either side of it so that from hopefully from day one, we get Spartina and mussels co-mingling to begin with and starting to populate that sill. This is the zone where we're leaving it unplanted to let nature fill it in. And then as we start moving up the slope again, we do it supplement with more Spartina more mussel socks, uh, some other plants as we come up and out of the water column and start going up the, the new coastal bluff. And then what I failed to mention too was we do have log protection. So we do have some scour that happens above the height of the existing rock wall, which is about the same height as where our sill is proposed. The water that comes across there and especially the ice in the wintertime, we get some scour right at this elevation, elevation 2.57. We, get, we have an area of bare soil all along the edge. So the proposal there is to actually place actual logs parallel to the shore to be able to provide that energy break, stop the ice from scouring, and provide a little bit more protection for the plants that are grow right behind it. In this location, you can see the existing grade is that steep bank up. This is where we're cutting into that hillside to be able to provide a more natural uh, uh, slope that is sustainable over time and we have done it so that again with that sea level rise as it comes up and that water starts to lap at it we won't get uh, erosion in that point. I will mention that we do expect this, that none of this is a hard permanent structure. We expect the living shoreline to be a living breathing thing. That's the whole idea. So it will change over time. There will be years when there might be a whole lot of one species of marsh and a year when there's something else growing and there might be times when we get erosion and all of that is part of the plan that's tried to be built into this so that it can self-sustain itself over time as opposed to putting in hardened structures. On the glass beach side this is the section so again similar mar uh, sill section uh, the same kind of planting the bottom of the sill but then you can see the existing grade down here is the dash line and all of the fill that we're placing to do the marsh creation to cover that glass and get a marsh growing as we work our way up the slope and the same log protection uh, at that same point and then up to the edge of what we're calling the kind of coastal bluff even though it's not truly that. Yep. What kind of trees are the logs? Good question. Uh, we have not specified what kind of trees are the logs. Because depending on what species you could have quite a um, unliving shoreline which they brought away quickly. Well, you know, and so we which want them might be a nice thing to have. Exactly. That's so we, we want the, this is not like a, a cedar log which we expect to last forever. We want this to be to decompose over time. Um, part of that it is it is an approved part of living shoreline design. We also saw work actually on the site kind of accidentally, right? So you had that um, you know, the barge that was right next door to the north that fell into the water, most of it was cleaned up. There were a few pieces that were left over. Those pieces did wash up onto the shore of this parcel. And when they obviously wash up parallel to the shore, 
and right behind it, Spartina started growing, right? So just that little bit of protection allows for the, the native marsh to start growing. So uh, that's the, the whole idea behind those. Can you point out on that cross-section where uh, deep might have jurisdiction and where the Corps of Engineers might have jurisdiction? Excellent point. Deep is, uh, well, I can show you on the plan a little bit better. So deep's jurisdiction line is this dashed line right here. The, the CJL, as you can see it labeled right there, right. it runs all the way along there. For the most part, the logs where they're placed is right at that CJL line. Um, the only difference is on this edge where we're actually pushing out in, and so the, the CGL is going to move landward, or excuse me, waterward when we're done. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously they'll have jurisdiction up to their current mark right now. Um, and so we'll, we'll be going through all of those regulatory permits with them as well. How about the core? Absolutely. Yeah, both. Um, and the core is involved primarily because of the channel. Right. Uh, so the channel, you can just see the edge of it here. Uh, this dock does extend to within their, it's not in the channel, but it's within their review area of the channel. We have had, Mark from First Water Engineering has had discussions with them. They've sent plans, they've reviewed them, and we had the preliminary determination that they think it's fine. Because that's essentially the last can, which isn't on the survey, is right about here. So the federal channel ends. This doesn't encroach into the channel, uh, and they look at it because it's for public access as a good thing to do. They'll also take a really close look at any native species that are in there, particularly any uh, that are, are nearing extinction. Uh, and it stopped a couple of projects with, with uh, subaqueous facilities like this in Hartford just because of that. So early conversations are encouraged. I like the plan. I, I think it makes sense and uh, it, it, it is very appropriate for that area. But uh, if they discover that uh, the short-nosed sturgeon is nesting in that area. Yeah, we have tape. we have had them out to the site. Uh, we also had DEP was out on site with us, and, and I say like the entire team of DEP, all the different divisions came uh, last week. We met them out there and reviewed everything with them as well. And then we also had Rich Snarski when he he's done all of our identification on site as well as our, our subaquatic uh, identification to look for anything that could trigger any of those things. So far, we have not found anything that would not allow us to do this. Great. Early conversations are smart. And, and also, the uh, deposition of material in a navigable waterway uh, that you're proposing, I, again, makes all the sense in the world. I, and I, I really do like that proposal. Uh, early discussions on deposition of material also, so they know what's coming. Yep. Yep. Uh, all right. So that's I'll say effectively the living shoreline. Did I have, I think I, uh, well, I'll show you this image just talking about the ice scour and how high tide gets up. I know that we, none of us probably recognize this anymore, um, but this was ice a few years ago uh, on the site. So this is right down here. I'm basically standing here looking out this way. Um, so you can see the top of the wall is right there and in line with that kind of ice break. Um, but we do get ice that comes over the top, and as it is pushed in with wind, we get that scour right along that edge. And what that looks like uh, here is that bare soil you see right along there. That's that elevation 2.5 where we get that, that scour happening, and that's where we're putting the logs. Uh, that's the end, living shoreline. So then, um, probably what most people are here for, the boathouse. Um, this is the first floor plans of the boathouse. Um, this is the Lovelace House, again, so Route 27 is now kind of at the bottom of the page. The Lovelace House is picked up and moved. You can see the renovated interior floor plan to basically be, uh, you know, a large common area as well as then uh, a changing room for all the, the rowers to come and go. This is the, the vestibule, the connector between the two, and the boathouse itself. Uh, stairs, egress, this because it is lower at that elevation 9-ish, you know, up to the 13. We have stairs and an elevator lift that goes, serves back and forth. This is that bathroom that I mentioned in the, the corner closest to the park to serve the park. Second floor plans, uh, the, the house has basically got some office space in the upstairs. It's an existing staircase up. Uh, nothing, no second floor over the connector piece. And then within the boathouse, it's a, a training exercise room. So those are all the ergs uh, stationed up there. They've got some storage room, some weight rack space, 
uh, and then a balcony that overlooks the water because it's going to be an absolutely gorgeous place uh, to watch the Mystic River from. 2D eleva uh, elevations of the building. This is the Route 27 side on the top. So again, the Lovelace House re repositioned. I will note that we're leaving uh, per SHPO requirements. All the siding uh, has to basically be replaced in kind as best as we can. The front door stays. Although if you will pay attention in the floor plan, there's no door there and there's a whole bunch of bathrooms along there. So the door is inoperable, um, but we are required to leave it there. It is a faux door as well as faux windows because we don't want those into the changing room either, but uh, we're required to make that, that facade stay the same. And then uh, per National Interior Standards for Historic Structures, they want the separation between you know, new and old to be uh, starkly different. So this is the, the glass connector between the two. And then the boathouse itself. This was uh, intentionally designed to look like a barn that could have been associated with the building from that time period. And it was intentionally done with the roof slope down to the road to minimize the mass of the building from Route 27. Uh, because it is a large building and it would be larger, significantly larger than the house itself, the way you angle and pitch the roofs uh, is important. And so this way it looks much more appropriate from the roadside. This is the riverside, again, boathouse. You can, you can see the names there, the Jim Dietz Rowing Center and the Hart Perry Boathouse uh, on both sides. This is that upper story balcony area, the boat bays, the connector. We do have some uh, large seating steps, if you will, going up to the connector in the middle, as well as then ADA access that wraps around the building uh, to get up from the, the roadside elevation to the first floor of the building. The north-south elevations, this is the elevation facing the parking lot. Uh, so as I mentioned, they've got the Stonington S and Oars at the top of that peak. Uh, you know, a roof pitch again, this is done intentionally so that from the roadside it looks de minimis as opposed to if this was the facade facing the road it would be a little more imposing. Uh, and then this is the north facade, so if you're driving south on Route 27, this is what you see. Uh, SHPO required us to put the building in that location, so it was the first thing that you would see if you're driving into town. Building materials, uh, I won't go through all of them, but you can kind of get the idea of the, the materials. This is obviously as close to the representation of the existing Lovelace House as, as we can put back. The connector and then the rowing center. A couple renderings on, on hopefully what it can look like. You can see the stadium seating right outside. This is that front corner entry as you come in. You can see the drop off area, the dock in the background, uh, the boathouse with some lights on the side of it. So we, we intentionally, I should have mentioned in the lighting, the lighting, street lighting is along the street. We intentionally don't have any lights in the center island of the parking lot because as you're coming in with the boats, so those boats are 60 feet long on a trailer, it takes a big swing to get the boats in and out. And the boat sack, the bow and the stern actually stick off quite a ways off either end of the, the trailer. And if you're coming in, it's pretty easy to take off one or the other if there's a light pole in the wrong location. Um, and so we've, we've intentionally left all those high things out of the center island of the parking area. Are the building bars front? No. Uh, where's the, the freestanding sign? is not shown in that rendering. It, it would be located right about, right here. Can you use, Lynn, can you use microphone, please? Thanks. The height of the sign? Yeah. Let me find it for you. Five foot six high, uh, mounted two feet off the ground, and four, and a, four foot two inches wide. Is the siding uh, board and batten, is it natural cedar? Will that be finished or just? I will let Mike answer. It's, it's oh. a natural uh, cedar product. Um, it'll be unfinished. We'll put a weathering can you, can you, excuse me, could you come up and use the microphone? I hate to do that to you. Thank you. Yeah. So as Chad stated, the exterior of the house will be the existing cedar siding uh, painted to match the current view. The, the boathouse itself, we're looking at a cedar uh, TNG product with a batten over the top of it. Um, it's just a natural finish. 
um, that weathers it to a, kind of a natural brown. So that's a kind of representation of the color of the boathouse, but it'll take it a few years to get there. Thank you. Uh, last couple of things I should mention. I do have uh, the letter, the, the official notice that was sent out to the abutters and the certified copy for the mailing. Uh, I don't know, we received today at about lunchtime the letters from DEP, so I don't know if those made it into your packets or not, but they, I can give them to you as copies. Uh, the, we got one as far as the map amendment for the zone change. Yeah, well, um, that's consistent. Uh, the, the change is consistent with their coastal management. The other letter is about the, the site plan portion of it. Uh, they basically commend the town for going to this length for this type of a project. They do note all of the additional um, requirements that we're going to have to go through for a DEP. Uh, and they, they mentioned the one for structures dredging and fill and flood management and remediation. And they gave us direct contacts for all those people. So we can submit. I'll give you all of them. All of those for the record. Thank you. Um, as I did mention, we do have the full drainage report from Weston and Sampson. It uh, should have been able to be attached. Um, no, nothing major. The only thing I would point out if you really you know, want to get technical on the stormwater drainage is uh, normally you try to get one foot of clearance between the groundwater and where the bottom of the infiltrator can be. In this instance, we're really... Normally we want to get two feet, excuse me. This instance we can only get one foot of separation between the bottom of the infiltrator and the typical groundwater location. Uh, we did talk about that with the, engine, the town engineer. He was okay with it. Again, given the circumstances as to elevations, where groundwater is, where our final surface can be, how we can pitch water to a low point, collect it, treat it, get it into an infiltrator, and get it back out of an infiltrator, we're very limited on our actual vertical uh, clearances there, and so he was all right with that. Uh, change and then um, lastly I would just say uh, the impact statements if you want me to quickly go through some of those as far as the the master plan amendment application were required to either ask for waivers or require a, a reply um, the fiscal impact we are asking for a waiver because the town the property is owned by the town and the building will be operated by the nonprofit and there's no residential component to the project therefore no school age children to be added to the population uh, and the project will add open space and coastal access to all residents of the town. Traffic impact, we are asking for a waiver. Again, this parking lot has been assessed and will continue to be assessed by OSTA uh, and, and in conjunction with the hotel project right next door. So we feel that's a highly uh, investigative process, I'll say, going through OSTA and, and they really look at all the numbers and, and greater than we can provide you in just a, a traffic uh, report. Roads and drainage, um, we do have a response for that. So we have provided a complete drainage report provided by an engineer. It shows that 100% of the stormwater can be treated from all the imperfect, impervious surfaces. We do have a photometric plan. Uh, we have designed it to be minimum levels of light for safety and aiming everything down uh, as needed. Uh, all the parking and circulation are designed in, with, uh, in accordance with town and state guidelines. And there are sufficient water and utilities on site to service the building. Cultural impact, we are not asking for a waiver. We have a very lengthy response as to why we think this improves uh, the culture, both of the historic and environmental culture and aesthetics and heritage of the town of Stonington. And then uh, the maintenance of public amenities uh, is, is significant. Compatible with public views is, I think, pretty obvious that we're trying to improve all the public views through this project. Reinforcement of the street building and massing patterns. As I explained, why we had to move the building. SHPO required us to move it where, where it had to go. Uh, and we wanted it as close to be able to repeat that massing pattern. And then we did the same thing with the boathouse building by turning it and making it uh, the smaller side face the road, again, to reinforce those historic massing patterns and provide as much open space uh, for public view through to the river. Um, and then protection of and compatibility with local significant historic sites, vistas, and features. We think this project can, is, is supporting all of those uh, and creating more. Uh, and there have been no archaeologically significant resources identified on this site um, historically. Natural resources. 
Um, again, I, I think we're doing everything to enhance the natural resources as much as possible, turn what is a, a brownfield site into what should be uh, a showpiece for both the Stonington as well as all of the state and how to do um, responsible shoreline coastal development. Uh, so I won't read that whole thing, but that's the last uh, part of the responses for that. Um, I won't go through the CAM. I, again, I think the letter from DEP, although you haven't seen it, does, uh, you know, it speaks positively uh, to the project as well. And I think with that, I have the rest of the slides of all the technical details and stuff like that, but I didn't think we'd, we'd go through that unless you have specific questions. Questions from the board? I just have one question, and it's a great plan. I have to say that. Microphone. The fire suppression. Oh, sorry. There's, there's no sleeping quarters. It's, it's basically a training <laughs> facility, storage facility. Um, we've met with uh, local fire officials, and, and both the architects and fire officials feel like because of its size and its use, it does not require sprinklers. Okay. All right. Thank you. When, when there's an event or a race, how many people usually show up? Like, what's the attendance? So, so we've had an ongoing race called Coast Weeks, which is our biggest event, and that usually brings about 300 rowers uh, into that event and, and support people as well. At Stonington High School, when we row, it's typically our high school team with one or two other teams. Most of the teams are similar size to us, 40, 60 kids. So usually it's a couple buses and a couple of trailers that kids come in. They're held, uh, Predominantly row in the spring and the fall, so it's really before the seaport is moving. So there's open spaces in the parking lot, so the public doesn't really see much when we do it. It doesn't really slow down traffic at all, it has no real impact. Um, a lot of the rowers row early in the morning or late in the evening, so we're, we're typically on and off the water you know, before the seaport opens and after they close. So, so again, for the last 25 years, we used parking lots in Seaport because they don't really care. They're usually vacant when we're coming in and out of them. So. You see any issues with the hotel using the parking there? Any? No. Well, again, I'll say the parking lot will be fully reviewed as part of the park yeah. by OSTA as well. Our recommendation right now is just what we're showing. The right in, right out uh, for this. We intentionally want to have southbound traffic coming down Route 27 going just to the hotel to be able to turn in in this driveway and then turn in to go to the, the main driveway of the hotel. And we want the park entrance for people dropping off or coming to the park to be able to turn into this driveway um, right now and be able to go through. We, we think this is the safest, best use uh, of the dual driveways. There has been discussion about should it be a one way in and a one way out, but that would force all traffic through here. We don't think that's the safest. Um, however, OSTA has the final say, and so they'll be the ones to tell us what we have to do. Uh, this is what we think, this is what we're recommending as our best uh, recommendation. Thank you. Uh, actually, quick follow-up question on that. Uh, will there be signs, you know, directing on the roadway so people know, okay, here you're going for the boathouse and there you're going for the, the hotel? Yes, on, on the signage plan, there's a whole bunch of uh, directional signage required by DOT for which ways are the one ways, which is the no left turns, um, all that is on there. I didn't okay. jump into all those, but yes, okay. those, those are on the, the plans. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Question, uh, actually a comment more than a question. Um, this probably is the most detailed set of plans I've looked at since I've been appointed to this commission in, in the last three years. So kudos to all the design uh, uh, people listed on the front page, Kent and Frost, Weston and Sampson, AECOM, all groups I've worked with before, and top-notch groups uh, for, for assembling such a detailed set of plans. I don't have a single question except one point. I would like to see a photometric plan included. Um, in the, in the, I'm sure you did one and just bind it into the plants because uh, infiltration uh, or exfiltration of light off a site like this is very important uh, to all of us, particularly in this area, particularly out over the water. And, and uh, your description was enough for me for tonight, uh, but, uh, but kudos also to the town's leadership uh, who oversaw and uh, uh, the preparation of these plans uh, and bring them forward. It's the most detailed presentation I've seen since I've been on this commission. Thank you. Any other questions? Comments? Yeah. 
So I have a couple. And I do like the planning, and you did a great job. Um, but it's about the lighting. You know how I am about the lighting. Uh, so, you know, the the bulls, uh, the, the short lights that Ball are going Right. <clears throat> how many are there going to be, and where are they placed? I kind of missed that. Yep. So that these little rings. <clears throat> I'm on it. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, so, from a photometric perspective, the bollard light is right there. The 0.25 foot candle, right, mm -hmm. which is a very small amount of light, 0.25 mm -hmm. foot candle is that red ring. Okay. Right? And so then the next bollard light is 50 feet away, and that's the 0.25 foot candle. So we barely get 0.25 foot candle spread from one side of the walk to the other side of the walk. So we don't, these are not bright lights shedding a ton of light. Will you see the glimmer mm -hmm. of that light? Yes. Um, you know, and you'll see the pool of light where it hits the ground plane, but it's not going to be, you know, it's not a, a red fluorescent strip up an entire side of a building. Right. But right now it's dark. So how many are there? There are one, two, three, four, five, six, ten. Ten that have lights. And again, we spread them out quite a bit so that we can have pools of light from one to another, uh, worked with the police commission uh, so that they could have the, what they felt was a safe amount of light for them to be able to patrol as they drove by. Um, so was one of the options that the, the light is a semicircle towards the, towards the street or the internal portion of the property versus the water? Uh, we had, I believe, one of the fixtures that the committee did review cast light in one direction, mm -hmm. um, but it was the direction towards the water. Uh, because of the light placement on the landward side of the walk, we want the lights on the back side of the walk, that the light would have to spill onto the walking surface, which is on the water side of the light. So, the, so those instances where we had a cutoff on one side um, mm -hmm. It was still spilling towards the water side. And I guess it would depend on what your view is, because up here it would be to the north, and here it would be to the east, and over here it would right. be to the From the south. water, I'm thinking from the water. Right. And the reason I ask is because my understanding of the police commission was that they were worried about people in the park, not necessarily the water. Well, it was... Yeah, I mean, we, we expect people to be, if they're in the park, probably on the sidewalk, but they could be anywhere. But again, the, if the light is going, it's not going to be light enough to see somebody from the light. It's going to be mm -hmm. more of, you'll see a dark shadow walk in front of the light behind them. Mm -hmm. uh, because that's the level of light we're looking at. Okay. It's not like a spotlight that they're going to see an individual. You're just going to see a shadow moving in front of them. Yeah, yeah. It's just, just uh, I had to be honest with you, and you know, because you went through the whole thing with the hotel. Yep. You know, <clears throat> that section, you know, from the water is very dark. And so, you know, now there's going to be, you know, this development, which is minor development, don't get me, get me wrong, but you're going to have those lights, kind of a ring of lights. Then you're going to have the hotel and yep. the lights associated with that. So holistically, you are changing that whole section of the river from a night perspective. Again, the building is beautiful. You've definitely kept it in, you know, <coughs> in, uh, the tone that everybody was looking for. I just wondered if there was another way to deal with the lighting. Well, I, I would say, you know, the, currently there's the or currently there was the Latitude Restaurant. It was a two-story building. They had the tent outside with the lights all summer long. That it was well lit and probably overly lit compared to what the hotel should be. Uh, here we obviously had a house and a big garage next to it that did have some lights on it and would have lights in it when people occupied it. And then you still have the Rossi Mill above and behind it that does have windows along the whole facade. Not lit a ton, but it does. It's, it's not like it's a complete dark sky environment, right? And you have uh, the street all lights. the street, street lights, lights on there. You have the neighborhood, all the residential houses that start lining up. So I, I'm definitely, we don't want light pollution 100%. I agree with you. We tried to put the minimum amount of light we could out there to provide a, a safe public park. Um, at the lowest light possible. Yeah. yeah, that's true. And, and great point. We intentionally did the three-foot bollard light as opposed to one of the options was, you know, a 12-foot pole light. 
you know, that we could have put that all along the shore, um, and that would be a very different effect. It'd be a very different comment. Too. I agree. Okay. So. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, a question. Your walkways does double duty as access to the boat ramp. Is that correct? This over here, correct. Yep. So, so if I wanted to launch a small boat, I would have to be dragging it down the walkway to the ramp. Is that correct? Yep, you would, if you were dropping off along here, I mean, there's nothing to stop you from walking across the lawn. No, 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 right? no, no, no. <laughs> but if, if, uh, if you wanted to, say you were dropping it off on your little dolly carrier, you had a two-wheel, you could put it on and drag it across, you most likely would come down through here, come through the bollards, down here, drag it down the ramp, launch it, tie it up here, and then take your dolly back to the car. So, so you wouldn't have somebody backing their... Chevy Suburban down that walkway to launch a boat. No, nope. Uh, nope. 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 Okay. <laughs> nope. They're, 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 that's why the bollards are there, is to keep people out from doing that. Uh, we do. This is not a car. We do not want any cars okay. backing down okay. this. So, so quite quite small boats. Boats that can be handled by rooftop carrier. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Is that it, Fred? Um, the floating docks. They stay in year round. No. You pull them out. They probably will get pulled. Yes. And where do you store them? Uh, right now, they get stored on site. We'll look for a location where they can be stored, or possibly we'll talk to the seaport about that. There is some. They do some of their floating tied up for the winter. They won't be like usable for the winter. This one potentially, depending on how it gets final design, we have seen them where they just lift the whole thing and, and bolt right. it to the pier high out of the water right. column. That could be an option. Um, I should have noted that this, the crew dock won't have the piles right. uh, because of the way rowing works and you need the oars for launching back and forth. Right. Uh, so there's an elastomeric anchor system way out there so that you don't see any of the, the piles associated with a normal coastal pier. And what will be the depth at low water, at low tide rather? Let me... It's going to be pretty darn shallow, right? Um, it's It's... Not, well, it depends on where you are, right? So this is our negative five contour. Okay, I didn't see it, yep. Yeah, and negative four, so that we, we get that depth that we need over the, you know, so we're not sitting on the bottom. Right. Um, and that's why some of these ramps are so long to get out to that depth. I, I figured. Yeah, and the, those are the real low, low ramps. This uh, is a floats. very low profile crew dock. Okay. Any other questions? And I think I forgot to state who is seated for this public hearing. So just for the record, in case I'm... Losing it. Ryan Daisy, Chuck Shee, and myself, Ben Philbrick, Fred Dykeman, and Lynn Conway. Any other questions before we go to the public hearing? Yeah, no, I'm sorry, just a quick question. I know that the main crosswalk is over by the parking lot. Are you guys thinking that there might be another part crosswalk being put in? We are, there's discussions and requests right now to DOT uh, to put, well, I can't see it. <laughs> uh, there's two crosswalks at that light currently. Mm -hmm. on the, and the, the main one is on the south side. We're asking for one to be added on the north side so okay, that people yeah. don't have to kind of go the long way around. Yeah, okay, great. Well, that would help with the new uh, no. Rossi Mill correct. entrance correct. way, correct? Yeah, as they're in the process of redesign, they mean DOTs in the process of redesigning that intersection. Um, so we're asking for that to be added. Thanks. So now it's going to go to public comment. Okay. Oh, we're not done yet. We're getting close. <laughs> All righty. Ben Tamsky. Or against or just general? I don't know how you have this on. Uh, general comments. All right, perfect. Thank you, Chad. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to the design team. It really is a super project, and I, I'm very much in favor of it. But I, just, I did want to speak to one point. Um, I'm here to speak about future uses of this park, which I don't think have been given enough consideration. In 2015, in the approval for the Coogan Farm property just up the street from this project, PZC stipulated that the applicant would need to return to the commission prior to the scheduling of any third party or private events. Two to three years later, they did just that, and that board, which some of you sat on, by the way, 
put some pretty strict restrictions on the size and frequency of third-party events there. There were concerns about traffic and parking, as well as the appropriateness of using that site as an event venue. The Board of Police Commissioners had their concerns as well, and I have attached their letter. I hope that this commission will also stipulate that this applicant shall return to the PZC before any private events are allowed on this site. I actually hope that you will go one step further and require a public hearing before any approval is given for this type of use. The reason that I think that the public hearing requirement is appropriate in this case is the fact that this is a publicly owned property. It would only be fair to the taxpayers who have generously ponied up to purchase and build out this public asset to have a say in all of its potential uses going forward. I have attached copies of the letter from the Board of Police Commissioners and the stipulations from the Coogan Farm Special Use Permit. I have also attached the minutes from the PZC meeting of January 16, 2018, where the new stipulations for the events of the farm are codified. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Laura Graham. Good evening. Can you hear me? Does that work? Okay. Uh, Laura Graham, 2 Moss Street, Pawkatuck. As a candidate for first selectman, please allow me to go on public record in support of this exceptionally well-conceived project. If I were to have the privilege to serve, I would work energetically to make sure it is fully funded and realized. It is a common belief that design by committee is not a good thing, but having followed this project closely since its conception, I would like to point out how much this project has improved through time. Congratulations, Stonington, on coming together to create a project that is sensitive to and will benefit so many. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, Madam Secretary. Rob Simmons, 268 North Main Street, Stonington. I rise in support of the application for the creation of the Mystic River Boathouse Park. Seven years ago this month, a small group of Stonington residents from Mystic Village, Pawkatuck Village, the borough, and elsewhere around the town met at Latitude 41 Restaurant in Mystic to discuss a dream, a dream of Boathouse Park for community rowing and a permanent space for the Stonington High School crew, most of whom have gone home. <laughs> I don't blame them. <laughs> I wish I had too. We had a plan, and with the overwhelming support of the town and the assistance of the Trust for Public Land, we secured this 1.5 acre riverfront property that was a part of the former Rossi Mill adjacent to the Mystic Seaport. At the time, the Westerly Sun editorialized and said, Stonington residents will have the opportunity to leave a legacy for generations to come. A legacy for generations to come. Now here we are, many years later, after many challenges, <laughs> right Nick, and obstacles and disappointments, standing on the cusp of that legacy. So now it lies with you to say yes or no, or maybe yes with a stipulation or two, not too many I hope. And I encourage you to say yes and give the community the opportunity to go forward to secure the legacy and realize the dream. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dylan Flack. I want to start by saying that I am neither a candidate for first selectman or a previous first selectman of Stonington. <laughs> maybe one day, 20, 2052. Now you 2052, are, now you maybe. are. Yeah, maybe, maybe one day. Um, but I just want to speak on behalf of the boys crew team. I am the current captain uh, of the boys crew team. I'm a senior on the team. 
And I really just want to talk to the points that were brought up earlier about how crew is really a sport that can have a profound impact on a lot of people. And I know that serving as captain of the crew team, I've seen it change a lot of the people who I, I've been responsible for over the last year. Um, and I really just want to thank the board, Mr. Chairman, and all the work that you guys have done to you know, bring this project to fruition. And uh, I hope that you vote yes, because I don't know if you followed our results recently, but we've been pretty fast on the water. And uh, we actually have an even faster group of guys coming up, uh, freshmen and sophomores. So I hope that one day we'll come here and bring you guys a gold medal for all the work that you've done to support us along the way. But uh, for now, I just want to say thank you for all the work that you guys have done uh, and continuing to support our team. Uh, and I hope that you vote yes on this uh, incredible project that was put together. So thank you. Thank you. No one else has signed up. Would anybody else like to have a chance at the microphone? For, against, general comments? Uh, my name is Dr. Bigel Morris. I've been uh, a resident of Stonington and a homeowner since 1970. Um, and uh, I just want to say how encouraged I am that this project is going forward. I know there will be some um, hurdles to overcome, but I uh, encourage you very much to overcome those hurdles. I have a foot in three worlds. I'm a rower. I have six children and ten grandchildren uh, that, who are not rowers, but I want them to have access to the Mystic River. Um, the Mystic River is a gem. I don't know how much you appreciate it, but if you've rowed in rivers like the Schuylkill or the Charles or the Connecticut River, you know what hazards there are in a real river. The Mystic River is more of an estuary than a river. Uh, it always has water, it doesn't have debris, it doesn't have boat traffic, and it's just a gem for small boaters, and I encourage you, vote yes, please. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Oh, my hand in the back. Uh, hi, I'm Matthew Drago. I'm a resident of Pock Duck. Um, I'm on the team currently. My brother was earlier. And um, I was at one of the first meetings where they voted to actually start working on developing this park. I've been waiting for a while to see something actually happen. And uh, seeing all the pictures we have of it, really impressive. Uh, I'd like to thank them for their work. I'd like to thank you guys for actually listening to what they have to say. I just want to say I'm glad it's an opportunity not only for rowers and the crew team, but also for the rest of the community with uh, the boat launch we'll have there for things like kayaks, because I know. Like, I like to kayak, but there's not many places around here, especially for, you know, coastal town. Um, so I'd like to say thank you, and I would also like to re-say, please vote yes. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Any other comments? I thank you for the lesson in coastal resilience and responsible coastal development. My name is Maggie Favretti. I live at 19 Whitehall Landing in Stonington. I'm a rower. I'm also trained and expert in community resilience and well-being, uh, climate change and health specifically. And all of the research indicates that people are healthier, the community is healthier, we can deal with the mental health challenges that the trials and tribulations of climate change bring us better when we have access to the river, to other natural resources, in this case, are one of our greatest assets in this community. So please vote yes. We'll all be better off for it. <laughs> Thank you. Last call. Would you like to have a rebuttal, Chad, to anything? Do you want to start? All right.
Thank you all. I know it's very late. Um, just to clarify um, one point, just in case you are considering any sort of stipulations. Um, when we worked on our lease, we obviously had a lot of conversations about use and what uses would be appropriate and back and forth. And we brought in a lot of different partners. And one thing just to point out that might be of interest to your um, board is that the police commission working with the police department has a whole new process now that you might be aware of for reviewing events. And when it hits a certain level and they have different ratings and rankings. And so any event that will have an impact on traffic generation would have to go before the police commission. So there would be an still an opportunity for public comment should say the Stonington Community Rowing Center want to have a regatta or want to have some sort of large scale event there. So just to be sure it is clear, there is still really good checks and balances without any sort of additional stipulation. But there aren't any weddings in the plan or um, that sort of thing, reunions or? No weddings. <laughs> So no, no live, no, no live else. music. Uh, if I could just say a couple of things, um, we've worked really hard, and again, we've had some time to put this together. So we've reached out to a number of different organizations in town, and we are working now very closely with the Denison Pequapsis Nature Center to provide educational opportunities for them. We're working very hard with the Seaport to create opportunities for them. We have a relationship with the YMCA to provide opportunities for them. This is a big building. There's a, there's a, and, and it should get utilized. It is a town building. It should get utilized to its fullest extent. And, and our belief is the best way to do that is to let the public have access to it. So for our rowing programs, we're going to use it a percentage of the time. But our expectation is that the Parks and Rec Department will be hosting things there. This will be a very, very nice asset for the town of Stonington. And I'd be concerned about if we try and over-regulate how it's used. It's, it's, you look at the sports courts at the high school. For a long time, those were the domain of the high school. And now Richie's done a very good job with Parks and Rec to provide opportunities for pickleball and tennis and basketball and, and other groups to come and use them. And, and that's really our whole intent here is let's, let's create a community center based on the water where people can get access to the river to go canoeing, kayaking, paddleboarding, rowing, if they want to yoga in the park through you know, the Parks and Rec Department, great. That's, that's an excellent opportunity. So, so I just want to make sure that we're, we're not kind of, and I understand neighborhood concern of too much traffic, too many people, all those types of things. But um, I, I think that can be easily managed. I have a question. Um, you're familiar with the Small Boat Association in Stonington Borough Harbor? Absolutely. Could you do something like that? at this facility to have a storage rack for small kayaks and boats. <laughs> it's kind of a small space. So we're, we're, I, I figured, but I didn't know, it was, has that been considered? It, it's, be it's in the thought process, we've talked about it. We, we're, we're trying not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but, but again, one of the nice things is the Seaport has assets to things like that there. They have a whole sailing center that's a stone's throw away from there. So there may be some kind of further relationships that we develop. It could be a dock-based situation where at some point we set up a dock that has boats on it that people can easily access from the park. But it is only an acre and a half, so we're trying not to cover the whole thing with structures. So, no, I think it's a very ambitious and, and extremely well thought out plan. Thank you guys for your time. Any other questions? Clifton, your staff input? I don't have any other staff input. I will say I did receive um, additional nine letters and support that I'll be adding to the record for this, okay. too. Um, so I'll just add that to the pile. And are we all right with the town engineer? Yes, so I did receive uh, the town engineer's comments today. Okay. Um, and the only, the only mention that's um, additional onto this is that the applicant provide a post-construction certification related to the drainage system, but that's, again, pretty standard process. And Chuck, you don't have any drainage questions? No. No. Sure. This is a shorter about the staff the leadership, and for the design. It's an unusual I'm amazed. If, if I could say one more thing, just quickly. I think Chad Frost has probably 100 hours of pro bono work for every hour he's been paid for this job. This is a labor of love for Chad, and I think it comes through in all the design work he's done. He's been with us from the very beginning. He and I have been working on this, and 
you know, I, I'm very happy that you had that response because it goes to this man right here. So I have one other question just to address one of the comments from the public. Is there any intention for renting the space or the property out? So, so you talked about collaboration, you talked about other departments yeah. within the community, etc. Yes. I'm specifically asking about uh, renting it out to other parties, um, party on the lawn kind of thing. Well, we, we have no jurisdiction over the land, so that's the town. So that'll be managed by... Yeah. Um, just like if somebody wants to use um, the facilities down in Stonington Borough, the greens there, right, or they want to use Donahue Park, um, we have a whole, again, process in place that has to go through the Board of Selectmen, opportunities for public comment, depending on the traffic generation, police commission. So if somebody did want to use this public property, just like with any of our others, it would be the exact same process that would have to be followed, where there's always an opportunity for public input to provide insurance, they have to meet certain stipulations, so it wouldn't be any different than um, any of those other town parcels from the land perspective. Thank you. And I do want to make a point is on our staff report it says no comment on the Architectural Design Review Board. That actually meant they approved it. Oh, excellent, excellent. <laughs> that threw me for a loop. They should have approved yeah. it. I did it's check and it, it's approved. That was yeah. a, another tip of the hat that everything was through. Um, Move to close the public hearing, Mr. Chairman. Second. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Ryan. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Mr. Chairman, I move we approve the uh, decision on design waivers as requested. There's five waivers. Uh, the landscape architect did an excellent job of explaining why each one was uh, worthy of our approval. They begin on page 56. And uh, I move the approval of the waivers requested. Thank you, Chuck. Is there a second? Seconded. Thank you, Ryan. Further discussion on the waivers? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Mr. Chairman, I move approval of the decision on a zone change uh, as stipulated in the 70-page uh, uh, report and for the reasons stipulated in the 70-page report. Seconded. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Ryan. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Mr. Chairman, I move a uh, positive decision on the coastal area management application uh, for the reasons stipulated in the uh, town planner's report with all the comments. And I'm, I'm not putting any stipulations on this. I'm going to reserve them till the, the last site plan approval Second. stipulation. Seconded. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Ryan. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Mr. Chairman, I move approval of the decision on the site plan application uh, and uh, as with the following stipulations that the final site plan shall be reviewed to the satisfaction of the town engineer and I'm going to slightly modify the second recommended approval to include one additional agency which we talked about tonight. Alterations to the proposed site, this is the second stipulation, alterations to the proposed site following comments from Connecticut DEP, Connecticut DOT slash OSTA. He mentioned that they're in front of OSTA right now, that's the Office of Traffic Safety, um, and also the Corps of Engineers, uh, who I think you stipulated has jurisdiction, and uh, and we would want to hear from them. Well, shall be reviewed and approved by staff. Seconded. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Ryan. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Congratulations. Yep. <laughs>